Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, it is four o'clock um, on a Thursday, and so we are live again. Um, it's Thursday, and you know, I'm just excited to be back with you for another biotechnology live stream. Um, I, am, I am Dr. Danielle Snowflack, um, and I'm the Senior Director of Education at Edvotech. Um, I'm so happy to be back with you again today, talking about another fantastic technique in biotechnology, um, another crucial concept for biology, um, and that's the discovery of DNA and some of the chemical properties of DNA that we can use to extract it. Um, we'll talk get a little bit of history, a little bit of chemistry, um, and then we'll have a lot of fun doing an actual DNA extraction um, and building models. And so with that, um, let's get started. Okay, so um, just for those of you who are unfamiliar with Edvotech, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of history. Um, we are the biotechnology education company. Um, we went one slide too far. Whoops, go back. Um, we are the biotechnology education company. Uh, we were founded over 30 years ago now um, by Dr. Jack Churchian, um, a professor of biochemistry at Georgetown University. Um, and so this was a really exciting time um, in the biotechnology world. Um, you know, there were a lot of, you know, really creative, innovative technologies being developed. Um, you know, I always like to mention um, PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, which was a Nobel Prize winning, um, you know, technology that allowed us to amplify DNA. Um, there was restriction enzymes were being used in the lab. We were starting to use genetic engineering to make medications um, in cells. And there's been a lot of talk about um, medications being produced in cells recently um, with this antibody cocktail that's being used against COVID-19. And so a, a lot of the technologies that we're using today um, found their genesis in the 1980s. But the problem is that there was very little of this that was being translated into the teaching classroom. Um, and so thus Edvotech was born. Um, we work with educa educators to bring biotechnology into their classrooms. We focus on ways to um, improve biotechnology education in classrooms and help teachers um, bring the technology into the classroom for lesson and create these lessons that you know students can really engage with. They can have fun, they can learn, we can just demystify some scientific concepts um, and really foster the next generation of scientists through active hands-on learning. And so today, um, we're going back to basics. We are going to do an experiment. Um, we're going to focus on a molecule that is critical for biotechnology experiments, um, and that is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And so DNA is a genetic material found in all living organisms, from bacteria to plants to humans, and some viruses. Um, viruses are simple infectious particles that are generally not thought to be alive. Um, they need to replicate in a host cell and use the host cell machinery. Plus, not all of them have DNA as a genome, um, but you know, um, you know, some of them do contain DNA. Um, so scientists need to extract DNA from these living cells, these living tissues, um, to be able to analyze them. So we use DNA, we can use it in microarrays, we can amplify it with PCR. Again, we'd manipulate it using genetic engineering techniques to create biological medications, um, you know, um, restriction digest. So we would use special molecular scissors to cut up the DNA and more. And so, so DNA extraction is a critical part of many biotechnology experiments because we need to get the raw material before we can do the experiments. And so today's experiment focuses on DNA extraction from fruit or vegetable DNA. Um, and I will be focusing on um, my lab, Kit 1105. But you know, if you already do DNA extraction, this protocol works along. Um, you know, th this lesson is, you know, will be applicable for you. Um, if you're using our Kit S75, again, the protocol is largely the same. Um, and then we're also going to be using, um, we're going to be building a simple plant cell model using origami organelles. And so that'll allow us to re reinforce the relationship between structure and function of plant cells um, and encouraging your students to develop and use models. And so you'll see Maria, um, she has put a link in the chat box. Um, that link, we are, we are recording this demonstration and the slides will be available on our website. And so if you want to be notified when um, 
all of this goes live, um, please be sure to fill out that form that's in the chat box. We also offer professional development certificates for those who watch live. So if you'd like us to send a certificate, please be sure to check the box in the form. Um, this link will be live for about an hour after the presentation. Um, so be sure to clear, uh, complete it before 6 p.m. Eastern time. All right, so let's start talking about DNA. So what is DNA? Oop, go back. So DNA, um, so what you can see is we have a nice little DNA model here on our slide. And DNA, again, is deoxyribonucleic acid. And the basic unit of all living organisms from bacteria to humans is going to be the cell. And contained within that cell is this molecule, is this DNA. Um, today, we know that DNA is the blueprint used to build an organism. So our genetic makeup or our genotype is going to control our phenotype or our observable characteristics. The directions coded for in our genes controls everything from growth and development to cell specification, neuronal function, and metabolism. And so um, in this slide, we have a little picture of a representation of DNA um, that you can build. Um, and we always, I, you know, I, we always take for granted the fact that you, we always think of DNA as a genetic material and, and we know what it is and we know what it does. Um, but, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we were still discovering DNA and discovering what it did. And so I want to talk a little bit about the history of DNA um, and the experiments that proved to us that DNA was a genetic material. So um, it all starts, um, you know, in the 1860s. So the Swiss uh, physician, Friedrich Meischer, um, actually discovered DNA um, around 1868. And so uh, he, among other, you know, cell biologists and physicians, really wanted to understand more about organelles, about what the parts of the cell were, what they were doing, um, and just to start learning the basics of biology again that we're teaching our students today. Um, so Meischer was interested in learning more about the nucleus. The nucleus, it was a large, round, dense organelle surrounded by membranes, but what was inside and what did the nucleus do? And so Meischer turned to white blood cells to purify nuclei. And so starting material is kind of gross. Um, as you know, um, white blood cells like neutrophils, um, you know, represent, so he, he started, he was purifying nuclei from white blood cells. and so. Um, you know, he, white blood cells uh, like neutrophils uh, represent a large part of the makeup of pus coming from infected wounds. Um, so Meischer actually started with bandages from a local hospital. Um, and he would um, basically extract cells from that bandage um, ge very gently so as not to damage them. Um, and then he would use that as his starting material for his initial DNA extraction experiments. So Meischer carefully washed the cells from the bandages using salt solutions, and then he burst or lysed the cells to separate the nuclei from the cytoplasm and other organelles. He then used a series of steps, which included alkaline extraction and solution acidification. So he was changing the pH by adding acids and bases, and that resulted in the precipitation of a novel substance. And that substance, which he called nucleon, had chemical properties unlike any substance that had been previously identified. Now, by the end of the 19th century, um, scientists had described the nucleic acid as a polymer composed of building blocks known as nucleotides. But most scientists believed that this molecule was much too simple to comprise genetic material. There were only really four building blocks that made DNA up. And so the biological importance of DNA was not realized until much later. So um, in 1928, um, you know, in a separate set of experiments, um, Frederick Griffin was trying to learn more about the epidemiology and pathology of bacterial pneumonia, which is caused by the bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae. And so there are several strains of this bacteria, some of which are harmless and some or, or non-pathogenic, and some others which cause disease. And so looking at this disease from an epidemiological perspective, Griffin found that the pathogenic, so the disease-containing bacteria, and the non-pathogenic, or non-disease-causing bacteria, um, were present in patient, both patient, present in patient samples over the course of the case of pneumonia. And so he hypothesized that one strain of pneumococcus might change into the other, rather than simply having multiple types of bacteria present throughout the whole infection. And so with this hypothesis, he tested it. 
And so in his research, he observed that cultures of a normally non-pathogenic strain of these pneumococcus bacteria um, were able to kill mice, but only after being mixed with a heat-killed pathogenic strain. So we have a strain of cells that are alive, and they are non-pathogenic, and we mix them with cells that are dead, but pathogenic, okay? And so the dead cells alone can't cause disease, and the non-virulent cells, so the non-pathogenic cells alone can't cause disease. Um, but when we mix the two together, um, what would happen, the, the killed um, pathogenic bacteria, when we mix the killed pathogenic bacteria with the live non-pathogenic bacteria, what would happen is that the mice would then get sick, and so they would die. And so um, because the non-pathogenic strain had been transformed into a pathogenic strain, um, Griffin named this transfer of virulence transformation. And so researchers postulated that this occurred through the transfer of genetic material. So what was doing this transformation? At the time, most scientists thought the genetic material would be protein. Again, as I mentioned, DNA seems too simple to be the genetic material. But protein was incredibly abundant within cells, and the amino acid sequences of proteins was very, very divergent and, and very diverse. And so again, DNA was a very simple molecule, only four nucleotides, and they were linked together. Um, and so uh, at this point, you know, there was no conclusive evidence as to what the genetic material was. And so using Griffin's experiment as a baseline, as a uh, basing their research on a Griffin's experiments, Oswald Avery and his group in 1944 took the study one step further to try and learn which biomole molecule was genetic material. And so he and his group um, purified DNA, RNA, and protein to, into very pure pools um, from these um, pathogenic bacteria, these pathogenic S. pneumoniae bacteria. Um, and then he mix them with the non-pathogenic bacterial cultures. And so whichever, he mixed the DNA, he mixed the RNA, and he mixed the protein again with these molecules. And so whichever of the three biomolecules could transform the non-pathogenic bacteria to the pathogenic form, that must be the genetic material. And so the purified biomolecules were added, and then they were used to infect mice. And so only those recipient cells where they were exposed to the DNA became pathogenic, which led to the recognition of DNA as the genetic material. And so in a classic set of experiments, Alfred Hershey and his research assistant, Martha Chase, used bacteria and bacteria infecting viruses called bacteriophages to reinforce the findings that DNA was the genetic material um, contained within cells. And so Bacteriophage are pretty simple viruses. Um, they um, have viral capsid proteins, which then surround and protect their DNA genome. And so really they have those proteins, they have those RNA, DNA, the DNA genome, and not a lot else. And so uh, they, took two, they took the virus and they took one pool of the virus and they labeled, those caps, the, they labeled the capsid proteins with a chemical marker that was very specific to this one strain. And so in this case, in this figure, they were using sulfur to label the proteins. And in that pool of virus, only the, vi only the proteins were labeled. There was a second pool of virus where the DNA was labeled with, phosphor, uh, with, a, with a phosphorus label, so a chemical label. And so it would be these two viruses, one virus where the protein was labeled and one virus where the DNA was labeled. And so they mixed these bacteria attacking viruses, these bacteriophages, uh, with the solution of bacteria, and then they looked to see whether the bacterial proteins were labeled or the, bac viral, the um, bacterial DNA was labeled. And, and what they found was that when phage infects a bacteria, their DNA is going to enter the host bacterial cell, but the protein doesn't. And so these experiments together kicked off a worldwide race to unlock the secrets encoded for in our DNA. And so, you know, when I was talking about, you know, biotechnology that was happening in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s, you know, um, we were still unlocking the secrets of DNA with the Human Genome Project, which is when, you know, researchers went through the human genome and looked at every single base in, in a test population to determine, um, you know, what the location and the identity of every base. And so we're still learning about DNA and the properties of DNA, um, you know, even today. 
So again, you know, the DNA genome is going to be an organism's instruction book. And so these are codes for the structural proteins um, and necessary enzymes, et cetera, in order to build an organism. Uh, some DNA is responsible for genes, which are discrete sequences of nucleotides. The DNA genes are then transcribed into RNA and then translated into protein. So basically a gene sequence is a recipe that's gonna tell us how to build a protein. In bacterial cells, we find long threads of DNA organized into circular chromosomes. We also find plasmids within bacteria. So if you were with me last week, you know what a plasmid is. Um, a plasmid is gonna be a small circular um, piece of double-stranded DNA that is found in addition to the chromosomal DNA. Plasmids can contain extra non-essential genes um, that are passed between bacteria, um, an example of which is antibiotic resistance. Um, in eukaryotic cells, we can find the majority of cellular DNA in the nucleus as chromosomes. And so let me just switch my screen um, so that I can show you um, a model that I have set up. Okay, let's get my camera working. All right, there's my camera. And so here is my uh, plant cell model. Um, I have an animal cell model on the screen, but we're gonna be building this model a little bit later. But this is one of our origami organelles. And so in eukaryotic cells, we find the majority of the cellular DNA here in the nucleus um, as chromosomes. Though mitochondria and chloroplasts do also have their own mini genomes. Some eukaryotic cells can contain plasmids as well. Um, for example, uh, for example, plasmids are commonly used in yeast um, to genetically engineer them to produce useful biomolecules. Furthermore, I, as I mentioned, some viruses have DNA as genetic material, but this is not exclusive. And so in this workshop, we're going to be talking about a way to extract DNA from plant cells. And we'll talk more about that, the, the, this plant cell model and how we extract DNA from it um, more in a few minutes. But before we can perform these experiments, we have to isolate the DNA from cells. And like the researchers before us, we'll use the chemical properties of DNA to separate it from the other components of the cell. And so DNA, oh, this, there we are. <laughs> and so DNA is built from nuclei, oh gosh, now I went too far. Okay, so DNA is built from nucleotides. Each nucleotide has three basic parts. So they have a phosphate group, a deoxyribose sugar, and a nitrogenous base, which is gonna be our adenine, thymine, uh, cytosine or guanosine. And so the sugar of one nucleotide is covalently bonded to the phosphate group of its neighbor, forming long strands of DNA. A strand of DNA is paired with a complementary stand, strand in a sequence specific manner in that A pairs with T and C pairs with G. And you can see that in, in the figure that I have up on the screen. And so the base pairs are um, connected with hydrogen bonding um, and the DNA backbone is connected by covalent bonds. And so the sequence of nucleotides is very important and very specific for an organism because the order of these nucleotides is going to make each, each gene unique. And so due to the nature of the sugar phosphate backbone, DNA has an overall negative charge. And so we can see that the negative charge, and so we can see that the negative charge of the DNA backbone um, is going to associate with the partial positive charge of water, making it very soluble in water and this is a good thing because our cytoplasm is largely water and we would want our DNA to be soluble in our cells. So what are we going to need to extract DNA from cells? Okay, so um, I always want to, I'm always using, um, we want to use proper PPE, of course. So I'm going to be putting on my gloves as I go through what we will be using. Oh, I just realized I left my isopropyl alcohol in the fridge. I will be right back. Please hold. Um, if, this is a great time. If you have not filled out the form, please do that now. Um, and I will be back in two seconds. Thank you for bearing with me. That is the first time I've had that happen and super embarrassing, but it's for a very good reason. Um, let me just move this plant cell model out of the way so I don't mush it up. Um, and so um, what do we need to extract DNA from, from cells? Okay, so here is our kit. Um, this is again, the MyLab kit. This is MyLab kit 1105, extracting fruit and vegetable DNA. 
Um, and this kit contains you, pretty much everything you need to do the experiment. Um, so first we are going to need the DNA extraction buffer. Um, this buffer solution is used for the purpose of breaking open or lysing the cells. It breaks down the cell and nuclear membranes allowing the DNA to be released. So most DNA extraction buffers are going to contain several components. Um, one is a buffer that's going to stabil stabilize our sample pH. A chelating agent, which is going to inactivate DNases, which are enzymes that chew up DNA. A detergent that dissolves lipids, like the cell membrane. Um, and then salt, which is going to disrupt the interactions between DNA and water. And we'll talk more about that in the next slide. So we're going to need a crushing tool, um, which is going to be used with the buffer to physically break the cell walls and membranes. So I will be using a chopstick. Um, you know, you can use a pencil or any kind of long, hard, stabby thing you might have. I have this one labeled for DNA, um, you know, because I you know, want to make sure that I'm not using this for food afterwards. Um, so we're going to use fruits or vegetables to extract our DNA. Um, I highly recommend green onions. Um, I find that they work very well. And so I have a bunch of green onions here. Um, and these are our cells that are going to contain DNA. Um, we have the kit includes large and small test tubes. So let me get some out so you can see them. Here is a large test tube. And then we have a small test tube, which is our vessel where we're going to be performing the extraction. We include spooling rods and we'll use these rods to pull out the DNA from solution. And so these are coffee stirrers, um, but I like to call them spooling rods. It sounds much more scientific. And then we have uh, the reagent that I forgot um, in the freezer is our ice cold isopropyl alcohol. And so this alcohol is going to help us force the DNA out of the cell lysate. And it's critically important that this is as cold as you can get it at home um, because that is going to help us get the DNA out of solution. And that's the reason why I forgot it in the fridge because the fridge is not in my office. <laughs> um, and then we have the kit comes with um, calibrated, calibrated transfer pipettes. And so we're going to use these transfer pipettes to measure and move the solutions from tube to tube. And so, um, again, as I said, to extract the DNA from plant cells, uh, we need to break open the cell walls and membrane, the cell wall and membrane, nuclear membrane, and then separate this DNA from all the other stuff, like the organelles that are present in our cytoplasm. And to do this, we do this in a process called lysis. So we are going to homogenize our plant samples. Oop, how did I go that far ahead? We are, I see why my mouse is in the wrong place and I just keep bumping it. So there we go again, bumping it. Um, okay. And so um, we do this in a process called lysis. So we are going to homogenize our plant samples in our DNA extraction buffer. Um, and so this buffer, the combination of the salt and the physical crushing of the cells is going to liberate the DNA from our cells and from our nuclei. And so we talked about our DNA extraction buffer in the last slide, but as a reminder, um, salt is a component, in this case sodium chloride, and it's a major component of this buffer. Um, in the solution of sodium chloride, the sodium chloride molecule separates into sodium ions and chloride ions. Sodium is a positively charged ion, and as you remember, DNA is highly negatively charged. And so the negative char large negative charge of DNA is going to be neutralized by the positive sodium ions in solution. This, disru this disrupts the interactions between the DNA molecules and water, making the DNA less soluble in the water. Without the salt, the DNA would remain neg negatively charged in our buffer and would stay in, in a aqueous solution. And, but remember, we want to pull the DNA out of their solution. And so we are also going to add our ice cold isopropyl alcohol. And so you see, I have my little makeshift ice bath um, that I made at home in just a measuring cup with some ice cubes and water. If you have crushed ice or a good food processor or a good blender, use that. The smaller the ice is, the colder your stuff will stay because you get better contacts. Um, I had mine in my freezer right before this to keep it as cold as possible for as long as possible. And then we add that ice, we're going to add that ice cold isopropyl alcohol to the cell lysate. So DNA is not very soluble in isopropyl propyl alcohol especially when the negatively charged backbone is neutralized by the salt. And so the combination of elements causes DNA to precipitate from the cellular lysate as sticky white fibers. 
And then again, furthermore, we need to make sure this alcohol is super cold. DNA is even less soluble in cold alcohol and this promotes precipitation. So if we were going to uh, mix, if we were gonna mix, if this mixture was mixed and centrifuged, the precipitated plasma DNA would come out as a pellet at the bottom of the tube. In this experiment, we are gonna carefully layer the isopropyl alcohol on top of the DNA solution where the DNA will end up precipitating at the interface between the alcohol and the um, cell lysate. Um, then we're gonna use the spooling rod to pull the DNA out of the tube. So let's extract some DNA. Okay, so first things first, um, what we're gonna do is we are gonna cut our green onion. And so I like to, I'm gonna use a fresh one. Um, I did test this morning with another one. And so we're gonna, we want a, a roughly a five by five by five centimeter piece of cell, a uh, piece of tissue. And so that's like a, the, maybe the size of a pencil eraser, maybe a little bit more. Um, so you wanna cut that up. So we found that green onion works really well. Um, I did find that I had a white onion in my kitchen. It was a little bit old. Um, I tried using this protocol. It did not work so very well. Um, you know, but we've had people use tomatoes. They work well. Um, you know, you could try using fruits, though sometimes the pectin in the fruit um, might hinder the precipitation of the DNA. Um, you know, I'm sure if you could get enough of a house plant leaf in here, you could try that too. Um, the nice thing about the MyLab kit is it does include enough reagents for you to be able to do this experiment several times. Um, so you can try to um, extract the DNA from multiple different sources. So I'm actually gonna use my pusher stick to kind of cram this down closer to the bottom of the tube. And then I'm gonna use our DNA extraction buffer. Um, I'm gonna use our calibrated transfer pipette and I'm gonna add two mils um, of our buffer using this transfer pipette. All right, let me close that up. So that's the extraction buffer. And so I'm gonna take my chopstick and I am going to smash this tissue as well as I can. And you wanna do it kind of gently. You don't want all of your extraction buffer to go shooting out of the tube. But you know, I am going to kind of swirl the stick around using the side of the tube and the stick to crush. Um, you can see that already our solution is starting to get cloudy. If you have a flat bottom chopstick, chopstick like this, you can actually use it like a plunger to kind of crush this, this plant tissue. But what you wanna do is make sure that you're really getting it crushed into as much as you can. And so like I can still feel resistance from the pieces of onion. Um, you can see them falling out of the tube. You can see them being stuck to my chopstick. Um, this is science, science is messy. Um, you know, it's not perfectly clean. Um, this is my basement, so it's not perfectly sterile either, but I think this is fun because this is something that you can do at home. Um, and this is, you know, this is real science. Um, you know, this is a fun extraction to do. Um, and again, you know, it's hands-on, but you can make it really inquiry-driven by having students pick different fruits and vegetables um, and plants and have them try to see if they can get the DNA extracted. Now we know DNA should come out of all these plants, um, but some will be better than others. So, you know, a tender green onion might have a thinner cell wall than, you know, a different fruit um, or vegetable. And so we might be able to extract DNA better that way. Um, and so, um, you know, you can really experiment, try out a bunch of different things. Um, and see which works best for you um, and your family. If you're doing this as a homeschool lesson, I should mention this is a great homeschool lesson. This is a great distance learning lesson um, because everything here we're using is very safe and very easy to get at home. Okay, so I smashed up my cells, made a little bit of a mess, but that's fun. Um, and what I'm gonna do is we're gonna let this rest to um, get some of the DNA, some of the um, plant material to, um, you know, you, by gravity, settle to the bottom of the tube. And so I'm gonna use my favorite at home DIY test tube rack, which is a small container of your favorite modeling clay. 
Um, no name brand necessary. Um, you know, you just use whatever you have at home. I mean, you could even make salt dough from home if you wanted to. Um, but basically, this is going to allow me to keep the tube upright without having to touch anything. And so, um, you know, this is going to allow the, some of the cellular material to kind of get out of our way so that we can get our cellular lysate up to the top. And so in an ideal world, you would let this sit for a couple of minutes um, for the debris to set to the bottom of the tube. Um, but I know we all want to see DNA. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a thin transfer pipette. Um, the kit comes with the thicker transfer pipettes. I happen to have some of these around from another live stream. Um, and this is just going to make it easier for me to um, be able to move quickly through this experiment. Again, when you're at home, you're going to let it settle out. Or if you have some transfer pipettes around, um, you can use them as well. All right, so we're going to transfer our cell lysate into the tube. And you can see it's kind of cloud. It might be hard to see. There is, it is a little cloudy. Um, there is some cell in there, so some tissue in there, um, but not a ton. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take our ice cold out isopropyl alcohol. Um, again, you know, you want this to be as cold as possible. I actually have had it in the freezer for a couple days, um, you know, to ensure that it's freezer cold, ice cold. Um, if it's not cold, this experiment won't work as well. Um, and again, you're going to keep it on ice right until you use it. I don't even like to really touch the, the spout where it is um, because that would warm it just from the warmth of my hands. And then we're going to very carefully layer the alcohol on top of our cellular lysate. And so isopropyl alcohol and the DNA solution um, are going to have slightly different densities. So if you very slowly and evenly pipette down the side of the tube, um, you will create um, you know, you'll have the solution, you'll have two different regions, the lower region, which is the lysate, and the upper region, which is going to be your isopropyl alcohol. And right here at the interface, um, it's probably very subtle to see, um, but you can start to see some DNA actually precipitating. And so we're going to take our stirring rod, and we are going to put it in here, and we are going to twist, and we are going to stir, and we are going to capture our DNA strands. And if I did this right, you should be able to see that we are precipitating this gooey DNA out of solution. And so I, I hope what you can see is that there is like a clear string hanging off of my transfer, my um, stirring rod. And it, you can see there's like a thickness there, um, and that's our DNA. Um, and it's very obvious in person. Um, it's a little more subtle when you're doing it on camera. But let me see if I can get, ooh, there's some good gooiness. Um, and what you can see is like, you can even see the thickness, the change in thickness um, for the end of my pipette rod, my, my, my stirring rod. And the more we kind of stir and twirl, the more DNA we're able to capture. Oh, I really, I could see a really good gooey bit there, um, but I didn't get to put out. Let me grab another tube and take the rest of this DNA out and see if I could get the really good stringy DNA. Um, if you're able to see, you know, let me know what you're thinking in the chat window. Have you done this experiment before? Um, you know, I know DNA extraction is pretty common. Um, you know, how have you done it with your students? Have they had success? Are you, is it an experiment you're doing at home with your students now? You know, let me know what you're thinking or what your plans for this experiment are. Now I'm going to add a little more of my extraction buffer. Mush it up a little more and go from there. All right, mush, mush, mush. Mm 
Let's see if we can get some more DNA. And so I remember, you know, um, my brother, he was not a science major in college. Um, you know, he was a business major. Um, and, uh, but, you know, he went to a liberal arts college and they required everyone to take a science class. And I do remember when my little brother did the same experiment. And, um, you know, he called me up afterwards and he said, Danielle, I extracted DNA. You know, it was so gooey. Did you know DNA looked like boogers? And I was like, you know, uh, one part of me was very happy that he was able to visualize and see this DNA. Um, and the other part of me was like, ew, gross, you know, boogers. Is that the best analogy that you can come with? But yeah, it is pretty much the best analogy that we can come up with. Um, it is clear and stringy and gooey. And so, you know, I can see on my spool, I'm able to spool this thickness of DNA um, and it's goppy and gluey. And you can, you can see a buildup of white residue um, around the actual um, stirring rod. And so again, it's super subtle to do that and um, do it here. Um, you know, the gloppiness is probably the easiest thing to see, um, you know, when we are trying to, when we're trying to do it for the camera, um, you know, the, you can definitely see there's like a gel-like texture um, in that sample. And so that's extracting DNA. Again, you can do it for any kind of plant or animal tissue. Uh, well, we don't really want to do animal tissues, but this is from any kind of plant tissue that you would want to do it from. Um, one thing I would recommend is if you're doing this with a couple different samples, you know, you can wash and reuse these plastic tubes. I did as I was trying different stuff that I had around the house. Um, you know, in the actual biotechnology lab, we might not reuse things in the same way um, because we wouldn't want to cross contaminate between um, our different experiments so we wouldn't want to have you know onion cell dna in our tomato dna pool um, but if you're just doing this for fun around the house just to see what dna looks like you can wash and reuse the tubes um, so that you can do more extractions right, so let me get this out of the way because we're going to move on to the next part of our lesson which is actually connecting um, the dna extraction to an actual plant cell Okay, so let me go to the next slide. Um, so this is a plant cell. Um, we know that living things are made out of cells. So our onion is made out of cells, much like the cell that we're looking at here in this model. Um, however, not every cell is the same. So bacterial cells are gonna differ from protists, which differ further from animal cells. Some organisms consist of one cell, so they're unicellular, and others consist of multiple cells, so they're multicellular. And then furthermore, within a multicellular organism like humans, um, there can be many types of cells working together in structures like tissues and organs, and together they build a complex organism. So at its simplest, a cell is essentially a drop of a thick, watery cytoplasm surrounded by a layer of fats, which is the cell membrane, and that's going to form a barrier between the inside of the cell and the outside of the environment. The cell membrane is two layers of lipids that is going to be embedded with proteins that move ions and other molecules in and out of the cell. And so, again, contained within the cell is our DNA, the cellular machinery necessary to create proteins, which are the ribosomes. Um, however, that's where the similarities between all cells end. And through experiments, scientists identified two distinct types of cells. So we have prokaryotes and we have eukaryotes. And contained within eukaryotic cells, like this plant cell that we have here, um, are going to be a diverse collection of membrane-bound compartments or organelles that each have a different specific biological function. In contrast, biologic prokaryotic cells do not have organelles. Instead, all of their biological um, materials are present in the cytoplasm. And so again, we're looking at a plant cell on the screen, and this is a beautiful diagram of a plant cell, but diagrams can be boring. 
And so with origami organelles, we can build a plant cell, which will let us really engage with the content and physically manipulate all the different parts of the cell, which are gonna help your students transform the abstract ideas present in cell biology to a more concrete scientific understanding. And so again, this plant cell is going to allow us to examine the cells at a microscopic level, but, you know, in a hands-on manipulative. And so with each model, um, you know, there are several different um, resources you get. So you do get a manual with background information, illustrated assembly instructions, and study questions. Um, and then you can get full or black and white, it, you get full color and black and white models, and this is great because depending on your students, this is going to allow them to engage with the material differently. So here we have a version of the cell that I printed out in full color. Um, but again, like I said, you do get sheets where, um, you know, it's black and white. Um, and you can essentially color in the different organelles. So um, I have some crayons here. You know, we could have your students color them. You know, here is one of our organelles. I'm, these are the worst crayons ever. Um, probably came from a restaurant somewhere, but um, it is what I had found. Um, you know, I do have some markers here as well. Um, so we could use a marker. I have this light green Sharpie that we can use to color in. I think this is gonna be our rough endoplasmic reticulum. And so, um, you know, your students can color them. Um, you know, however they would want to, if they want to do it in black and white, you know, this is great for homeschool activity to try and get your kids to, you know, get off of the internet and do something, um, you know, fun building a model. And so, you know, you will color in the pieces. Um, again, if you're using the black and white version, if you're using the color version, um, you would simply print and cut. And so we cut out our organelle. I might not do the most beautiful job cutting this because I am cutting on camera, but you know, I just want to show you, you know, how to simply assemble one of these more simple pieces. So again, you cut it out, you're doing something with your hands, practicing hand-eye coordination, which I feel like I don't have much of, especially while trying to cut while talking. Let me cut out some of that paper because now it gets in the way. So here I've cut out this ER. And then what you would do is fold the tabs back and tape it. That is a giant piece of tape for what I need, but that is okay. And so here we would have our, our, um, our organelle. And so you're gonna do that with all of the pieces. Again, this is the full color version. Um, so I just cut and taped, but you can color in the color, the black and white version as much as you want to. Um, and, and one of the great things about origami organelles is that you can buy it once and print it as many times as you want to. And so with the purchase of a model, you're licensed for unlimited use on a single site or campus. And so these are perfect for distance learning because you can upload the PDF to Blackboard or your Google Classroom and your students can download or print. And so depending on your goals, your students can manipulate the pieces to learn how um, different uh, organelles work together in the cell uh, to sustain the cell's function. And so I'm just going to talk about mitosis really quickly. So let me color in my two chromosomes. And I am going to do a not fantastic job of it. But I want you to be able to see my chromosomes in two different colors. And you can see the chromosomes in the cell are the same color. Um, you could color those in um, however you would want to. And um, so I am just gonna roughly cut around these chromosomes. And so what we could do, what we would do is we know that in mitosis, we each of these X-shaped chromosomes is really two chromosomes that are connected to one another in the middle. Um, they are sister chromatids. And so what we would do is we could, you know, put these in here. Um, our two chro our, well, let's just do one chromosome for now. Um, I'll take out one of these black and white ones as well. I have them taped in here so as to not make a mess while we're talking. 
but you know, we have our two chromosomes and what we could do is cut them apart into our sister chromatids. You know, and we could actually physically model mitosis. So in mitosis, we would not only be splitting the chromosomes, you know, but we would make an entire other cell wall, cell membrane um, combination, um, and then split up the organelles between the two daughter cells. And then thus, you know, your students are physically um, manipulating the models and acting out mitosis and really engaging with the material um, to a deeper level. And so if they're doing this at home, you could even have the students, um, you could have them do um, an exercise where they label all the different components and they take pictures at each stage of mitosis um, and, you know, engage with the content that way and put together, um, you know, a little research, a little, um, you know, project, a lab report um, describing what they did. Um, and how, you know, the, the chromosomes did separate into two different cells. And so um, these models are great to help us incorporate some dimensions of the NGSS. Um, specifically, the development and use of models describe the function of cells and how cellular components work together. Um, and so um, in middle school, that's MSLS 1-2. In high school, it's HSLS 1-2. And so the plant cell is just one model, one way to use organ origami organelles. Um, currently, we offer over 100 origami organelles that you can pair with your favorite, or, uh, your favorite Edvotech experiments. And origami organelles, we are the exclusive distributor of origami organelles in the United States. Um, so that's pretty cool. You can get them from us at edvotech.com. Um, they are ideal for distance learning or homeschooling um, because you can print them. They each come with a lesson um, and you can build the models. Uh, and they're a lot of fun to, you know, have this to have the students be able to try them out. Um, and then, you know, we don't just offer plant cells. There are a ton of different kinds of cells that can be used, uh, a type of different lessons that can be used. Um, and so um, if you're teaching about COVID-19, you can actually pair um, an origami organelle model of the coronavirus with our MyLab Kit 1219 which is the detection of coronavirus by immunoassay, um, which we did show in a previous live stream. Um, if you're up with the Nobel Prize winning technology, let's talk about CRISPR. Um, CRISPR is an amazing genetic modification technique that actually changes bases within DNA um, to um, modify the genes. And so you can actually do um, a DNA experiment with Evotech one, Kit 135, and then pair that with the origami organelle um, number Z EVT031. If you're studying cancer, um, you know, we have a cancer biology kit where you can actually study cancer cells, and then you can build a tumor using an origami organelle. And so, um, just to kind of sum up, um, you know, I hope what you've learned today um, is that DNA is the genetic material found in living organisms and some viruses. And this was, you know, beautifully elucidated by a series of experiments um, in the late um, 1800s and early, in early to mid 1900s. Uh, again, I think it's fascinating um, to know that, you know, for a long time people thought DNA was not an interesting molecule and really it is the guidebook that allows us to build organisms. Um, you know, again, so it was first identified and described in 1868 and those experiments um, you know, done by the um, physician um, Meischler, but it was not recognized as the genetic material until we get to the experience of, experiments of Griffin, of Oswald, of Oswald Avery and his group, um, and in Hershey and Chase. And so we extracted DNA using alcohol precipitation. Um, I hope you were able to see that gooey stringiness that was in my tube. Um, you know, it's a very obvious and very fun to do at home. Um, and then students can model DNA extraction from fruit and vegetable models using cell models like this one from origami organelles. And so um, we will be posting the slides to our website um, and sharing this YouTube video um, very soon. Again, if you want us to email you when they're available, please fill out the form that is in the, that is linked in the chat box um, and we will send that to you as soon as possible. Um, oops, let me turn to my next slide. If there's any questions, please ask them now. Um, you know, we'd love to answer any questions you might have. Um, 
And so we are just really happy that you were here to join us for this lesson. If you need us, be sure to research, reach out to us at any time uh, at edvotech.com or try social media, you know, Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, uh, even here on YouTube. You know, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and we'd love to help you get bio, more biotechnology into your classroom. Um, again, so this is the origami organelle model for the plant cell, which I thought was fun. Um, and that's why I like to pair it with this fruit DNA, uh, fruit or vegetable DNA experiment. But again, if you're teaching, um, we have anatomy and physiology model. So if you're teaching anatomy and physiology, um, you know, you can pick up a model, um, you know, anything to kind of coordinate with what you might be doing in the classroom. Um, and I really think that the reinforcement of the labs with the hands-on model and vice versa, you know, is a really nice experience for your students to be able to, to make those connections um, and have a higher order engagement with the material. And so um, with that, if there are no questions, I just want to say thank you everyone for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this workshop. Uh, thanks for bearing with me when I left my alcohol in the other room. Um, you know, I might, uh, Next time I will make sure to have everything in the room in place in time. Um, please be sure to join us in two weeks again on Thursday for another biotech live stream. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, you know, and have a, have a great afternoon. Uh, and we hope to see you soon at another live stream. Have a fantastic evening or morning, wherever you may be coming from. Have a great day. Bye.